you if you need a comfort break or anything like that. His name's Robert and he's okay. So thanks, folks. We're going to ask uh, Lynn to go through the Cedron and apologies, please, Lynn. Yep, thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Um, as a reminder, this morning's proceedings will be recorded and will be subject to delayed broadcast on the Council's website. In terms of the Cedarian, if you hear your name, could you confirm your attendance, please? Councillor Maitland? Here. Robert Todd? Here. Councillor Friel? I'm here, Lynn, thank you. Councillor Cowan? Here. Councillor Mackay? Present, Lynn. Councillor Barton? Yeah. Councillor Holland? Here, thanks. Councillor Lennox? Morning, here. Councillor Crawford? Present. Councillor Watts? Uh, yes, I'm here. We have an apology this morning from Councillor Filson. Councillor Hogg? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hogg. Again, Councillor Stewart. I'm here, Lynn, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Provost. Thanks, Lynn. Um, for those folk that don't know, uh, the next item, uh, we're going into the business proper, and these, this is declarations of interest. And this gives an opportunity to members who are going to vote today if they have any interest in any of the business that's included here. And it's a really important part. It's a legal aspect. So I'll ask for any declarations of interest from any of the members here. Provost. Yeah, Billy. I'm on the Burnley A frame, but that's no one for planning. No, that's absolutely fine. Right. Billy. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Thanks for bringing that uh, interest, but I think David's okay with that. Uh, David Mitchell is our uh, monitoring officer and he's a head of legal and he'll give advice on this one. The bottom line is, is I don't see any potential for conflict because the other body that Councillor Crawford's a member of haven't made representation and aren't, aren't involved in or otherwise participating in this matter. They have expressed no view, so there is no conflict there. Uh, the only interest is, is obviously the Baron A frame is, is in close proximity to this, but uh, having to get to the representations received, I don't think there's any particular issue there. Thanks, David. Thanks, Billy. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much, Provost. Provost, it's not a declaration. Uh, it's just to, to ask a, a point uh, overall in relation to the, the planning papers. It's in relation to NPF four within the papers. I wonder if it's your intention to, to ask for uh, any overall uh, explanation uh, from planning about this, this matter at the start of the meeting, Chair. Thanks. No, you're absolutely right, Maureen. We're going to get a, 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 a wee uh, synopsis of MPF4 before we start proceedings. That's great. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, uh, declarations of interest are OK. Um, I'm going to ask Lynn to explain the hearing procedure because we're having a hearing for the first item and uh, Lynn will explain the procedure for that. Thank you, Provost. The hearing will begin by the Chief Governance Officer or his representatives giving an overview of the application. The objectors will then present um, their objections to the committee and members will have the opportunity to ask questions of them on the submissions made. Members, please note that this is not to be taken as an opportunity to comment on the merits or otherwise of the planning application. The applicant or the agent will then address the committee in support of the application and members will have an opportunity to ask questions of them. Again, members, please note that this is not to be taken as an opportunity to comment on the merits or otherwise of the planning application. At this stage, the hearing will then close. Following which appropriate clarification will be given by those officers present today. Members will then have an opportunity to ask questions of the officers and members will then move to determination. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, we're going to ask David to give us uh, a wee explanation, MP4. Um, OK, David. Thanks, Chair. Uh, morning, members. 
Um, just prior to hearing any of the items on the uh, committee agenda today, I just wanted to address you uh, to bring you up to date with some of the recent changes um, in the Scottish planning system. Um, from Monday the 13th of February, um, which was Monday this week, uh, National Planning Framework 4 uh, was adopted by Scottish ministers um, and following the bringing into force of changes to the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997, it now forms part of the development plan uh, for all councils in Scotland. Um, in the context of East Ayrshire, uh, the development plan now comprises of National Planning Framework 4, the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan 2017 and the Minerals Local Development Plan 2020. Uh, over the last number of months, National Planning Framework 4 in draft and revised draft form has been a material consideration um, in decision making and members will have noticed reference and assessment against it in many of our reports to committee during that time. Uh, the key change in this regard is that it now has elevated status as part of the development plan alongside our local development plans. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, decision making principles do not change in the back of this. Um, Section 25 of the 1997 Act continues to require that determinations be made in accordance with the development plan um, unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Um, Section 24 of that Act does clarify uh, that in the event of any incompatibility between the provisions of National Planning Framework 4 and the Local Development Plan, the later in date is to prevail, which currently will be National Planning Framework 4, at least until such time as LDP 2 uh, is adopted by the Council after its examination period. Um, the reports in front of you today reflect this revised development plan position and present details of relevant policies and provisions of National Planning Framework 4 insofar it is relevant to each development, as well as policies of the local development plan. And they also include consideration where it's relevant and necessary and whether there are any incompatibilities between them. Finally, now that National Planning Framework 4 has been adopted, uh, National Planning Framework 3, Scottish Planning Policy and the presumption in favour of development that contributes to sustainable development that was set out in SPP, uh, which were all material planning considerations, are superseded and will no longer require to be taken into account in decision making. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, members, we're going to go uh, into business proper. It's item three. Uh, on your papers, and it's the application for planning permission in principle for development of an eco wellness park comprising self contained accommodation units, open uh, brackets, not for permanent residents, close brackets, reception building, and associated wellness, therapy, educational, and leisure uses at the former Barony Colliery, Barony Road, Auchinleck. And that is uh, Planning application number 21 oblique 0778 oblique PPP. And I'm going to ask Vary to introduce this paper. Vary. Thanks, Provost. I'll just share my screen with you all, first of all. Find the right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Should hopefully be it now. So, as already stated, this is a major application for planning permission in principle for an eco wellness park, which comprises accommodation units, reception, associated wellness, education, and leisure uses. Moved on a bit too far there, I think. The application site covers most of the colliery and tip area, but does not include the Barony A-frame. So in this area, the Barony A-frame is located and that is out with the application site. And the red line shows the boundary of the, the application site. Uh, Barony Road here, Ochil Trade to the west and uh, Ochenlech to the east. The barony closed in 1989, leaving the A-frame, now a Category B listed building, and a large spoil tip stroke bing on the south side of Barony Road. On the north side of the Barony Road is the former coal pit processing area, which was redeveloped for the Egger Particle Board Factory, and that's in this area here. The surrounding area is largely agricultural, with Dumfries House Estate to the south, and here across the other side of the Luger Water. 
Uh, and the bing, the bing is a prominent feature which can be seen from the Freeze House Estate, Luger Water Trail and further away from the A70. You can see the contours on it here. It has steep sides, particularly around the south and western sides with a, a plateau area to the, the, the top part of it. Uh, this is a site plan, an existing site plan. Um, this, uh, the, the site is now has, has various paths over it for walking and biking and on the whole has semi-naturalised with grassed areas to the north of the Bing and on the slope south of the Bing. There are wooded areas around the perimeter of the site and on top and sides of the Bing itself. The site slopes from the Barony Road to the north, southwards to the Luger Water, with the Bing being some 40 to 45 metres above the level of the watercourse. There is a core path which runs east-west through the site, so running from uh, the Fries House Estate through the site, just following my cursor here, and beyond into the agricultural land to the, the west. Um, there is also a sort of more formalised footpath that runs up towards the A-frame and less formal grassy paths which run in this location here that are on Northern Survey map. A, a range of supplementary information has been provided with the application and these are listed on page seven of your papers. The design and access statement gives an overview of the development and a master plan has been provided to show how it might be arranged. I'll try, I'll try zooming in. A, so small. Uh, right, OK, so members will see on page eight that the proposed development comprises a range of uses related to holiday destination with, um, with various zones for wellness pursuits. Although the application is for planning permission in principle, a level of indicative detail is provided to show how these uses and structures could be arranged on site. So from the north third of the site, there is a reception and parking area uh, and hotel indicated. Uh, so this is the reception area around around this part. Parking is at number five in this area. There is an overflow parking in this area. Uh, the hotel is in here. Um, and then moving down, there are uh, this is an ecologies hub, mm -hmm. projected ecologies hub, um, containing various other uses. And these are the accommodation units which are spread out around the site. Um, in the middle third of, yeah, the, the colleges hub uh, also includes activities such as yoga, dance studio, Zen garden, and uh, the Zen, um, the hub with smaller uses such as a bar, distillery, craft and craft therapy. Uh, the middle section also includes 35 tree houses, 31 lodges, eight geodomes, uh, and 10 villas. On the lower third of the site, a spa is indicated, uh, and this is down here. Uh, and another hub with cafe, this hub here, with cafe, flora and fauna research and water education, as well as nominally 16 geodomes, which are these rounded objects. Um, Sorry, where was it? Um, geodomes, the, the overall concept is intended to uh, be accommodated within the natural environment. It's noted that patrons would arrive at the site at the uh, reception area, park if needed, then journey to the rest of the development by sustainable mode, such as walking and cycling, or with electric bu buggies used for servicing as well. It should be noted that the the plans here are indic indicative to illustrate how the development might look. Um, and so if it, if the application was to be approved, a uh, further application for approval of matter specified conditions would be required to show the detail. The scale of the development has been reduced since first submitted um, and currently seeks to develop 200 units. Uh, it was previously 324 of varying types described, as well as the reception hubs and spa buildings and hotel and various other uses. The semi-naturalised environment has led to several different habitats, but in particular one habitat called the open mosaic habitat supports rare and threatened butterflies 
and the plants they feed on, as well as other rare invertebrates. The site also uh, supports European protected species, potentially otter, but mainly bats, and eight of the 18 UK species of bat has been recorded here uh, along the, the Luger water in particular. So I'll move on to some of the remaining slides, which comprise some of the information that's been submitted with the application. Uh, this is a, a landscape principles plan that's been submitted, showing how it's proposed to um, enhance habitats. Uh, the dark green here is shown as a proposed Scots pine intended to enhance existing Scots pine. However, we're not aware of any Scots pine within these areas. Um, this shows the level access tree houses. Um, so there would be a use of a boardwalk used to access those uh, tree houses that would be on the steep slope. And this shows the so small. <laughs> I'm just trying to zoom in, but it's so small that it's hard to see. Um, yeah, so this shows the hard landscaping plan um, with the, this route here, which is an existing track, um, partly being the core path um, used as a primary access, and the rest, the, the other tracks uh, accesses would be a uh, secondary. And the orange uh, amber areas there would be the vehicle zones. Um, so there wouldn't be any private vehicles allowed beyond these areas. Uh, this is the tree removal plan, um, or tree protection and removal. So uh, what to know is the red, the hatched red areas are the areas where trees would be removed from the site to enable the, the development to take place. Um, so this is the northern half, northern part of the site. Uh, the middle part, um, you can see that they're showing sort of keyholing of uh, the structures into the trees. However, we think that this is probably an un underestimate of how much how much tree, tree removal will be required because there would be a need to access for construction and for patrons as well. Um, this is the access road. The main access road, which is existing, is a track which runs north south. Um, so there is tree removal proposed here, which I believe is to allow for the widening of this track. And again, you show the keyholing, but again, we would suspect that there may be more tree felling as a result, just to allow access for construction in particular. Uh, this is an area of long established woodland which is proposed to be felled. And the uh, southern third as well, showing the similar sort of um, tree removal proposals. So we're moving on to the next slide. Um, this is a um, desktop study of the site stability. Um, so the red areas are high risk. Um, stability areas and the amber is medium risk. So there is there are some development shown within amber areas in particular. And this is a section through the site. So this is the I think it's the productive ecologies mm -hmm. hub um, running down to two storey villas. Um, there is a kind of bit of a plateau here where there is, there's more of a grass grass area um, where the domes would be. And then waterfront villas, which I think are the, uh, the those that are on stilts um, due to the slopes, uh, the gradient of the land here. The Luger Water and then the Dumfries House Estate beyond and the wall garden at the bottom. Uh, this is a visualisation that's been produced that's from the south of the site, from the A70, um, showing how the development might look. Again, all indicative, um, showing the um, accommodation units dotted along the side of the bing here. And from within the Dumfries House Estate, uh, this is Avenue Bridge. 
Yeah, Ward Garden. Just the Ward Garden. All right, that's actually the Ward Garden, sorry, not the Avenue Bridge. Uh, so this is an extract from the local development plan. Um, the site is allocated for a miscellaneous use, it's 060M. Um, so this includes leisure use. I'll come on to this further later, later on. Uh, so moving on to some photos of the application site. This is taken from the Barony Road. The Eger entrance is to the left and then to the right here is uh, the application site. Um, the car parking would be beyond these trees. And looking back the way towards um, uh, the opposite direction. And the existing entrance to the uh, A-frame, um, the proposed access for patrons would be around the area of the conifer trees. Um, and these would be failed to enable the provision of a, an a, a overflow car park. Um, this showing the the A frame. Um, so the application site kind of runs along the sort of bund there, and the photograph is taken from within the application site. So these hard standings area, hard standing areas there, uh, would be used for car parking and the uh, reception areas. And looking back towards the A frame from within the application site. And looking back towards the Barrier Road. And southwards into the Bing. And back again, that's towards the Eger factory and uh, the A frame. And this is along one of the informal footpaths that runs through the site. And this is the track which runs north south to the western side of the Bing. And you can see the steep sides of the Bing here, which again falls away down to the, the right hand side of the picture. You can see how well it's naturalised over the years. Um, and this is looking further south down towards the Lugar. Valley and the Dumfries House Estate. Uh, this is looking roughly southwesterly. Um, you can see the, the steep sides again down uh, down to Luger Water. And this is looking back up on the, the, I think it's looking towards the north of the, the Bing, just from the southern area of it, one of the open grassland areas. Just to give you an idea of the um, of how it looks in the um, in the steepness of the sides and so on. Um, this is looking towards the wall garden. You can sort of see some of the buildings just there nestled in the in the trees. And um, this is part of the core path that runs down towards quite steeply down towards the Luger Water and into Dumfries House Estate. And again, looking back towards the A-frame and the uh, Eger factory. So just in terms of the assessment against the development plan, um, at page 38 onwards, uh, you will see the assessment uh, against the development plan, which now comprises NPF 4, as David has explained, as well as LDP 17 and the minerals plan. Uh, NPF 4 contains a range of relevant policies relating to sustainable places, livable places and productive places. Members will also see the key policies listed for MPF4 and that uh, overall the proposal is not considered to meet with these, in particular the policies regarding the nature crisis, biodiversity, natural places and forestry and woodland. Intrinsic to the assessment of these policies and the redevelopment of the site, 
and the, the Bing. The members will note that almost all of the southern two thirds of the site is spilled from the Colgary and potentially other sources, including demolition. And that the priority open mosaic habitat has since nat naturalised on top. The specific conditions of the Bing and surroundings has led to the colonisation of rare flora and fauna, and it's considered that the interruption of this fragile priority habitat as stated within the application will impact adversely on this colonisation, contrary to these policies mentioned above. NPF 4 policy on brownfield land notes that sustainable redevelopment of brownfield land is supported, but in determining whether the reuse is sustainable, the biodiversity value of brownfield land should be taken into account. And in this case, it is our view that the proposal is not sustainable due to the impact of the site's biodiversity and does not meet this policy. The second part of this policy notes that proposals have to demonstrate that the land is or can be made safe and suitable for the proposed new use. Members will see from page 56 onwards detailed comments on the potential development of the Bing in terms of the structure and composition and whether this is demonstrated as safe for development, including possible adverse effects on the surrounding environment and the species currently that use the site. The application proposed uses of stilts, use of stilts and minimal intervention into the Bing. However, although a desktop and initial geotech report has been submitted, no combined phase two geo, geo environmental or geotechnical ground investigation has yet been submitted to enable the assessment as to whether the Bing is capable of being developed or how. This is intrinsically linked to the above biodiversity and nature crisis policies, policies as it is a view of the planning service that the incidental works already indicated in the application to support the development may not be of the scale and magnitude described once the results of the phase two geo environmental and geotechnical investigation are available. In terms of the LDP 2017, members will see that the principle of the development meets the site designation for a, a miscellaneous opportunity. But attached to that policy are the notes that the proposed development should not adversely affect or compromise the nature conservation interest of the site, noting that protected grayling butterfly in the first instance. The LDP policies are by and large similar in aim to those of NPF 4 and the proposal is not considered to meet with the LDP policies listed at page 85 in your papers. With regard to the development plan, i.e. the LDP and the newly adopted NPF4. In summary, the application is not considered to comply in terms of biodiversity matters, i.e. habitats, rare or threatened species, European protected species, and the lack of information on these issues to inform the assessment of the application. And in terms of the Bing, the application does not demonstrate that the Bing can accommodate the development structurally, which could lead to consequential development works not anticipated already within the submission, which in turn could have more substantial impacts on ecology within the site and wider area than those suggested in the applicant's submissions. In terms of the material considerations, um, these include the consultation responses and representations. At page 11 onwards, members will note the consultation responses. Um, Auckland Lake Community Council support of Support of the development, Ochiltree made comments neither in support of or, or objection. East Ayrshire Business Development Unit are supportive of the type of development and economic benefits that it would bring to the area. East Ayrshire Leisure have a number of concerns regarding the Luger Water Trail and biodiversity, but do not formally object. Environmental Health have no objections once the Phase 2 Ground Investigation remedi Remediation Strategy and Verification Report have been received and are acceptable. Scottish Water, ERA, Ayrshire Rose Alliance and Flooding, Ayrshire Rose Alliance and SEPA have no objections subject to conditions. And uh, Scot uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust have objected to the proposals and members will note their detailed response at pages 17 to 22. And the response from Scottish Wildlife Trust is given significant weight as a material consideration. The representations at page 21, members will see that 63 people have objected to the application and two people were in support of it. 
Many of the objections query why an EIA was not carried out for the site, and this is explained at page seven of your papers. The main grounds of objection relate to the existing nature assets, biodiversity, ecology of the site, especially butterflies and other invertebrates, rare orchids, many rare and threatened, but also more detailed studies should be carried out for the application for mammals, butterflies and moths and other invertebrates, breeding birds and the open the impact on the open mosaic habitat. These objections include those from conservation organisations, including Butterfly Conservation Scotland, Bug Life and the Invertebrate Trust. Uh, other objections include uh, the impact on the core path, the quiet nature of the site and the wellness that people currently derive from the site uh, at, at, in its now semi-naturalised state, um, including its ecology. The site being out with a settlement and the impacts that would bring to the area and being located to an industrial use such as agar. Uh, the impacts on hydrology and the former mine workings and composition of the bing. Uh, objections were also concerned about the development that may be started and not finished and generally the submission documents which had a lot of green buzzwords and phrases but not necessarily required content to back this up. Two letters of support were received which noted the development would bring a much needed facility to the area and opportunities for renewal e renewable energy with a destination style development showcasing healthy lifestyles. Um, in summary, uh, the view of the officers is that the proposed development would cause significant adverse harm to the ecology and biodiversity of the Bing. This is contrary to both NPF4 and LDP, noting the emphasis that NPF4 in particular places on ensuring that development mitigates the climate and nature crisis. The potential economic benefits are noted, however, the development is not considered overall to be a sustainable form of economic development and it is recommended that officers refuse the application as per the reasons listed on page 94 onwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vare. Um, folks, we are in a hearing procedure now, so there's protocols to follow. Uh, there are, uh, as Vare said, numerous subjectors. Uh, there are two here today, uh, Mr Cobb and Mr Philp. And I would propose that um, if you could give uh, your objections, I propose that you each get five minutes, if that's OK. And what we'll do, coming into the last minute, I'll give you a wee nudge if it's needed. Uh, to let you know, but it's five minutes only. Robert will show you where to go and, and we'll start. If you could just introduce yourself, please, and, uh, and, and give your objections. Thank you. I I'm pleased to see that your case officer hasn't been fooled by the applicant's greenwashing and unsubstantiated claims. It's the correct assessment based on fact, not fiction, and you should agree the recommendation to refuse permission. What is not immediately apparent from the report is the applicant's appalling level of ignorance of natural habitats and processes and of agriculture. They believe they can create, apparently overnight, natural habitats that take centuries to develop. They believe they will attract species that simply do not exist in Southern Scotland. And they believe they will grow crops, even potatoes, on a coal bin. It's as if they've gone through reference books looking for ideas and thrown them all in to make it look good, with no knowledge or understanding of what any of it means or whether any of it is even possible. They just don't know what they're talking about though to a layman it might look as though they do. But anyone with specialist knowledge spots the schoolboy howlers straight away. The bewildering array of documents in the application frequently make claims without substantiation, statements without evidence, use meaningless and misleading expressions, even including things taken from websites of organisations that have no connection with the application, and some of the documents even contradict each other. I particularly like one comment in your officer's report. Another example of imprecise and vague statements, which sums the application up admirably. 
The applicant has repeatedly used the media for blatant propaganda to advance their cause, something we objectors aren't able to do. So it creates a one-sided perception. This week's Come Not Chronicle has yet another misleading article which talks about continued local support when there are just two supporters and 63 objectors. They will tell you local people don't care about the barony and are abusing it and they've come along to save it by building all over it. Well, 63 objectors shows we certainly do care. Reading paragraph 200 of your report about stability of the Bing, it occurred to me that in wet weather, the top of the Bing is very wet with standing water, but the bottom is dry. So the surface must be impermeable. So presumably it keeps the interior dry. Now start digging trenches and let the rain in, anything can happen. It might be thought that putting buildings on stilts will avoid ground stability issues, but buildings don't sprout out of the ground like mushrooms. Every building will need trenches to bring water in, trenches to take sewage away, access roadways for machinery, lorries delivering materials. That's a lot of ground disturbance as well as a lot of tree felling. The applicant has no expertise or experience in these matters. They've never built anything before. They're risk managers from London. Their company's house listing gives their nature of business as fund management activities, not building wellness parks, fund management activities. And they don't have the money to do it with either. They're relying on being crowdfunded. Ignore the applicant's crazy claims and fictional greenwashing. Take heed of the expert knowledge of Scottish Wildlife Trust and others. Take heed of the professional assessment of your officers. Refuse this application. The barony should be like other mine sites, at least a community woodland, preferably a nature reserve, and it may indeed become a local nature conservation site when LGP2 is complete. And don't forget, it's a grave. You wouldn't want them building on your grave. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cobb. Cobb, thank you. Uh, Mr. Philp, next. Uh, any questions? Chief? Oh, sorry. questions at the moment, yes, sorry. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Cobb? Thanks, Mr. Cobb. Thank you. Mr. Philp. And it's the same again, uh, five minutes, and we'll give you. If you need it, we'll give you a nudge for a minute to go. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to clarify, I'm representing the Scottish Wildlife Trust, uh, but also speaking on behalf of Bug Life, which is the UK's invertebrate conservation charity, and also Butterfly Conservation, and joining them in reiterating our objection to the development. Uh, First, and I know this has been talked about already, but uh, we would like to commend the planning department on their thorough report on this application. In particular, we note the references to NPF4, um, which among other things clarifies the national priorities regarding developments affecting wildlife rich sites, including brownfield sites. Um, this is, I am told by colleagues in some of the other conservation organisations, one of the first times that NPF4 has arisen in a planning application, so we note that with uh, with approval. The Barney Bing has been known for its wildlife value for many years by local naturalists, and the Scottish Wildlife Trust proposed it as a listed wildlife site several years ago for its birds, insects and plants, and also as a prime example of its natural wild rewilding. Um, and correspondence makes it clear that this importance is recognised by East Ayrshire Council, obviously by other conservation charities, but also by the developers themselves. Uh, I won't repeat all the, the objections that we've come up with. You have all the papers in front of you. But we'd highlight a couple of further points which we think are important uh, and which illustrate some of the deficiencies in the evidence presented by the applicants. Such deficiencies occur frequently, as Paul has just pointed out. Um, but a couple of other uh, newer points have, have come up, which I think are worth mentioning. Um, we note in the application that 
uh, the results of the invertebrate survey haven't been presented. There's a preliminary invertebrate survey which states quite clearly that more investigation is required. Um, and it also states that uh, the development can't be fully considered without taking into account the results of these targeted invertebrate surveys. These surveys were carried out some time ago um, and the evidence still not has uh, still not been produced and we believe that that uh, would show uh, in more detail the importance of the, of the site for invertebrates. Uh, another example um, of the questionable quality of some of the survey work relates to uh, the breeding birds or the birds present in the Bing. In the documents provided by the applicant, the bird survey records 49 species being present in the Bing with five species breeding. Now, last year, um, local ornithologists carried out survey work on the birds on the Bing. They recorded 64 species as opposed to 49, and 35 species definitely are probably breeding, but another 12 possibly breeding. That is in contrast to the five species breeding, according to the report. Now, while the, we, we would acknowledge that the recording effort might have been rather greater from the locals because they're staying locally, um, the difference, I think, is sufficiently striking to uh, raise questions about the, the validity of the, of the initial uh, claim. So based on our examination of the information presented by the applicant, we consider the Bing is not a suitable site for development of this type. The size and the scope are incompatible with safeguarding the wildlife, and the proposed mitigation is both insufficient and unrealistic and frequently runs counter to accepted ecological theory. Animals and plants have in many cases very specific requirements. These are usually very difficult to recreate in the short to medium term, and on a brownfield site such as the Barney, with its open and mosaic habitats, these um, conditions have usually arisen gradually through ecological succession from bare spoil to woodland or grassland as the habitats mature. About one minute. Hmm? Right. Uh, indeed, if circumstances dictate, the bare spoil may remain as spoil. That's the beauty of natural rewilding. It's unpredictable and unrepeatable. We hope the application will be rejected and that the Barney Bing will be added to the list of local wildlife sites in LDB2 and would ask that it should be considered for designation as a local nature reserve. Most local authority areas have several local nature reserves. In East Ayrshire, there's only one at Catherine Vos, and we think that safeguarding this site in this way would contribute to the Scottish Government's aspirations to protect 30% of the countryside for nature by 2030 and help to meet the targets set at the recent COP15 meeting in Montreal and adopted by Nature Scott. Uh, it would be a great shame if such a unique site and opportunity for local people to enjoy uh, the nature on the site, uh, if, if this opportunity was lost, it would be a great loss to the whole of East Ayrshire. Thank you very much. Within the five again, thank you. And uh, I'll open it up, Mr Phil. I'll just uh, the members maybe may need to ask some questions. I don't know if they do. Members, any questions for Mr. Phil? Councillor Cowan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Phil, I may be asking a question that you don't have the expertise um, to ask, but just on your background, uh, the felling of the trees. What sort of impact would that have on the bird species? Um, well, that would depend on the particular species, but uh, the the. Bing is, in terms of its birds, is dominated by birds that um, are essentially woodland birds, and the removal of the, the, the woodland to the extent that um, is being proposed would have a significant effect. And indeed, in the in the bird report um, produced by the applicant, um, it does talk about significant detrimental impacts from the felling. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Watts. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, when the site was used um, as a colliery site, um, the wildlife that's currently there uh, would not necessarily have been present. Um, my question would be, if a development were to take place, um, is there any reason why this wildlife 
would not necessarily return within the future once a development had been um, established. Um, the disturbance will effectively, um, well, will effectively disturb the wildlife that's there at the moment. The extent to which that happens would depend on the nature of the disturbance. Obviously, if the place is being felled, that's a significant impact on, on, on the trees. Um, once that initial disturbance is passed, you have a completely different environment. Uh, in spite of the, the uh, desire to um, merge the development into the uh, into the landscape, um, there will be significant disturbance, digging up um, access trenches for services, etc. Um, and certainly the same uh, the same habitats would not return. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, partly because of the disturbance, partly because of shading. Um, but the whole point about rewilding is that to a, a large extent, it's unpredictable. That doesn't mean um, that uh, it wouldn't return to something um, resembling the natural state. Uh, in fact, it would be very, very unlikely that it would. Um, so we couldn't say what exactly would be there, but we can be pretty certain from uh, studies elsewhere that it would not be anything like what it is just now. And it would be significantly poorer because the area would be much more homog homogenic, um, much more similar. The open and mosaic habitats are just what, it, what that says. It's a mosaic it's patterns and patchworks over the, the whole of the Bing. That is what makes sites like this so important and making uh, reducing that uh, diversity would be detrimental. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Mr. Philp? Not online either. Thank you very much, Mr. Philp. Thank you. Uh, members, on to the, the second part. This is the applicant's opportunity to put forward um, uh, the, the arguments. And it's uh, Scott Mackay and Irene Bissett. And I would uh, advise uh, maybe 10 minutes for both. Uh, and that's uh, commensurate with which was there before. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, Irene Bizet from National Pride, and I am Scottish, I'm not from London. Um, I'm going to keep my introductory very, very short because Scott has all the responses and he's got a lot to get through. But I just wanted to attend here today to meet everybody, to show my face and to demonstrate that National Pride is real. We are committed, we are investing and we will deliver this project if we get the opportunity. National Pride is a community interest company. Uh, we were incorporated in Scotland in 2018. And our model is based, is underpinned uh, by our network of partners. Um, we've got hundreds of partners within our network who between them bring thousands of hours of experience um, and expertise between them. And it's them that give us the credentials to support our brand and carry on with these developments. We've engaged world renowned experts in the fields of architecture, engineering, ecology, leisure, tourism to advise and guide us with this development concept. This is not just a whim or indulgence of a few people uh, with an impossible dream. This is real. We believe that this project will stimulate economic regeneration in this area. It will create hundreds of jobs. It will attract inward investment and it will benefit the local community, boosting confidence in the area, providing hope and creating something to be proud of. The clues in our name is National Pride. My own personal interest is that I am I am the daughter of a man who worked underground for 25 years. My dad was an electrician in the Leeds Victoria pit 25 years. 
So I've lived in that mining community. I understand the hardship and the backbreaking work that these men did when they worked underground. I've lived through the devastating consequences of the, the community collapse when the, the mining industry collapsed um, and the uh, and the and the rifts that were caused between families that still exist today. What I have the opportunity to do here now and the privileged opportunity is to take a site that, that has given us the fossil fuels of the past century and regenerate it and to develop it into something for all these benefits that I've mentioned, um, but also to showcase the clean renewable energy of the 21st century. So take it from where it's been into this modern world that we live in today and all the benefits accruing. I mean, since arriving in East Ayrshire, when we acquired the site in 2020, we've met so many individuals and organisations that have invested in our vision and they want to be part of it. They want to be active stakeholders. I don't have time today, but we have received so many direct um, contacts and inquiries from people that have read about us, they, they've seen our vision, they've, talk, they've seen our objectives, our aims, they've liked it, they've had similar um, aspirations, etc. They want to be part of it. There's so many talented people. I am humbled every day by the people that approach us that, that, that want, as I say, to be part of this and will be part of it if we get the opportunity. We have been warmly, warmly welcomed in this area and we want the opportunity to deliver on our promises. I am going to leave it there apart from finishing off by saying that I've been across to this neck of the woods on site, um, various meetings, whatever, blah, 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 a lot in the last couple of years. Every time I drive here, I pass the welcome signs into East Ayrshire. The welcome sign is welcome into East Ayrshire. It has two words underneath it, forward together. We would like the opportunity, please, to go forward together. Thank you and over to Scott. Thank you. Um, my name is Scott Mackay. I'm a Chartered Town Planner, a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Since the Barony Colliery closed in the mid 1980s, it has remained in private ownership, having passed from British Coal to Hargreaves and more recently to National Pride. During that time, beyond some initial landscape works and improvements to the maintenance of the listed A-frame, little if any management of the site has taken place. And the planners regularly used the word semi-naturalised. As confirmed by the planner's report, there is no official designation of the site for formal outdoor access. Beyond the core path which crosses the site, the public have been able to informally access the site, mainly for walking and cycling on informal paths. However, there is no management of the site for public use, nor of its natural assets. In acquiring the site, National Pride identified the potential of the site for natural uh, regeneration and to bring it back into beneficial use with consequential ecological, economic, social and health and wellbeing benefits. This is a brownfield site. Nobody disputes that. Even the objectors, Scottish Wildlife Trust said that. The site is allocated in the local development plan for a develop development opportunity site for leisure and recreation and the planner omitted to mention the local development plan also goes further. It's also allocated for industrial, business and storage and distribution uses. Planning permission was previously granted on the site for a development of business and industrial units, including a factory outlet provision, car parking access and landscaping. There are no environmental protection designations attached to this site. For example, SSSIs or areas of local importance for nature conservation. In fact, not just the adopted local development plan, but the proposed LDP, the LDP2 also assessed that whether that it should be designated as a local importance for nature conservation and did not agree to do that. And the council approved the proposed LDP2 without any nature conservation designation on the site. Objectors to the application, including local representatives of the Scottish Wild Drive Trust, made reps to the LDB2 to get it designated as a site of local importance for nature conservation. But as I said, the Council approved the LDB2 without any designation and have continued the development opportunity designation of the site. Um, the, um, there's 
and we're not going to be able to cover everything in the time that I've got, but um, just to kind of summarise there for uh, the planning uh, application process was screened for environmental impact assessment and the council planning officers deemed that that was not necessary. They, we did a formal pre-application process, which the planners made a, a list of documents that they wanted us to submit in support of the application. We've submitted all of these documents and gone further. As a major application, uh, this also was carried out pre-application consultation process, and which was, you know, nearly wholly positive and the only negatives that we got from the local community was from the objectors Scottish Wildlife Trust and Bug Life and they essentially made the point that they opposed any development on the site. We, they, they referred to their own survey work but they refused to provide that survey work. We wanted to work with them but they refused to engage with us. This is a planning permission in principle. Detailed plans and surveys are not usually submitted at this stage. A simple red line of the application site is the minimum required. Applicants can submit additional information if they wish, and planning authorities can ask for more information if requested to give the application proper consideration. On larger sites like this, that might include flood risk assessments, stage one contamination assessments, habitat assessments. In this case, we have submitted everything that the planning department has requested. And, um, and we have gone beyond what would normally be required in a planning permission in principle. The revised submitted indicative master plan and survey submitted was attracted only seven objections. The application was re-advertised and attracted only seven objections, so actually reduced from the, not the original 63 objections. The issues that have been raised and the reasons for refusal were not raised by the planning officer since that um, resubmission. NPF4 was not raised by the planners. Concerns of NPF4 was not raised by planners since that resubmission. Therefore, it is a surprise to us as applicants given that the reasons for refusal that have been set out. As, as has been said, NPF4 uh, now forms part of the development plan, but it was only adopted on Monday this week. And the officer's report, however, places a heavy reliance upon it. And it is our view that the policy provides actually provides significant weight in support of the application, given policy nine, which states that it seeks to encourage, promote and facilitate the reuse of brownfield land. Given the late adoption of the policy and the reliance of it in the officer's report, we have been deprived of a fair and reasonable opportunity to properly comment on its implications. There's nothing in MPF4 which should oppose the use of this site for the purpose intended by this application. Granting permission in principle were appropriately worded suspensive conditions at this stage would enable that conversation to be continued okay, with National that. Pride. And the council and the community stakeholders can continue that conversation with National Pride in order that a final appropriate form of development on the site can be agreed. Granting this application today would give a clear instruction to everyone involved to get around the table and find a suitable solution. Forward together, as Irene has mentioned. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak. Thank you. And thank you uh, for being within the 10 minutes. Um, members, uh, any questions for the applicants? Councillor Barton. I know it's in page 38 in the Asia Chambers of Commerce and Industry report. It says, highlighting the use of geothermal energy from the disused mines for the use by the local community and the local NHS hospital. Has any exploratory work been done in this or is it just a concept at this stage? There's no specific work that's been done in relation to this site. However, we do know from the survey and historical records that there are chambers still in existence under the site which would given current technology, allow the opportunity for geothermal energy. They would, in order to, 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 to confirm that, we would have to drill boreholes to test that, um, which we, we would do as part of a detailed application stage. Although just to add to that, we have um, had a relationship with Strathclyde University who have um, shared data with us, analysed it and given us the um, technical information that we need to understand that it is a, it is feasible you know that there is the um i'm not a technical person but that there, there is the um the water uh levels um in terms of heat etc to uh to substantiate that a geothermal project um could be 
feasible. Obviously, it depends on um, the financial viability as much as anything going forward, but we have a really good steer to start that whole exercise. Thanks, Graham. Uh, any further questions, members? None online, thank you. Uh, that's the hearing uh, concluded. Um, at this stage, the Head of Planning and Economic Development or, or the representative will address the committee and give the appropriate clarification on any issues that have been raised so far. So is it back to Vary? Thanks, Chair. Um, just running through some of the, the points made by the applicant. Um, it is, we are aware that the site is allocated for a development, miscellaneous opportunity within the a local development plan at present. Um, however, that is um, caveat, caveated by the point that it, it, it's noted that it is of conservation value and that any development would have to show that it's avoiding um, uh, impacts on the site, um, on the nature conservation of the site. Um, so that coupled with MPF 4, which um, is now adopted, um, has been in a revised date for several months, so it's no surprise that it has now been adopted. Um, it's been around for a while. There have been opportunities for the applicant to submit information along with the other information that's been submitted. Um, so it's, it shouldn't be a surprise and we do have to take it into account as part of the development plan. That's just in the legislation, so there's no way around about that. Um, planning permission was previously granted, I believe, for a factory okay. use um, mm -hmm. in 1999. So it's some time ago now, uh, many local plans ago. Um, so we wouldn't hold, um, put any weight on that. Um, That's probably about all that I would address in terms of um, what the applicant has said. Um, although it is, I know that the point was made about the about it being just a PPP application, it is necessary for uh, us to be to, to have the demonstration that the constraints of the site can be um, addressed properly um, before we would want to grant planning. Uh, planning permission principle and um, once planning permission principle is granted then the, the principle is there so leaving matters such as uh, stability matters um, um, along with the, the tree removal and so on until that stage is, is not really acceptable to us uh, to, to, to do that. Um, what the application should have been doing is demonstrating how th those matters would be uh, addressed properly. Um, that is really all that I've got to add. Thank you. Thank you, Vary. Uh, well, David, yep, sure. Good morning. Thanks, Chair, members. Uh, for those not aware, I'm the Chief Governance Officer and the Planning Service sits within Governance Services, so the report and the recommendation sits in, in my name, although I'm not a planner, I'm a lawyer. I thought it'd be helpful, given David's comments at the beginning, David Wilson's comments, just to clarify the position of MPF4, um, maybe just to respond to one or two points made there. I don't consider the service has relied on MPF4. I consider we've applied MPF4 in our assessment of the application. Our function isn't to come to a view and then justify it. Our function is to assess the application against the policies that are there and to come to an honest and professional view, which is what we always do. And of course, others are entitled to a different view on any interpretation or application, any policy. But I think with regard to MPF4, as David explained at the beginning, its content isn't new. Its content didn't just spill out into the public domain on Monday. MPF4 has been there for quite some time. And what David highlighted there at the beginning was it's its status that elevated. So it was something that had to have been considered before Monday. It's now something that has to be considered since Monday. But the content didn't just arrive on Monday and everyone involved in the process has had fair notice of what the potential impact of MPF4 might have been. There was hope and aspiration to bring this application, if I remember right, to both the December and the January committee, but for reasons that don't 
bear on anybody here or reflect on anybody. It wasn't possible to bring it. But the point I'm making is, even if it had been here in December, we would have had to have regard to MPF4, but just not at that elevated status in terms of the change in the hierarchy that took place on Monday. I would also direct members' attention in particular to pages 85 and 86, uh, paras 237, 238, where the overall assessment is summarised against the local development plan, including both the NPF4 element and the local element, and it's quite clear it's not entirely about NPF4. NPF4 and the rest of the local development plan contents are not mutually exclusive. They both touch in the same areas. What NPF4 does is perhaps raise the bar on some of the ecological and environmental considerations compared to LDP2, but it doesn't stray into areas or introduce new areas that in every case aren't already covered by LDP2. So whatever the banner this has been looked at under, the issues would have had to be addressed. And finally, I accept absolutely it is for permission in principle. And that's about balance. But as a planning authority to grant permission, even in principle, you still have to be able to answer certain questions uh, in the positive, which is, are you satisfied? Are we satisfied as planning authority that the impacts, the potential impacts before you grant permission in principle, that the potential impacts are acceptable and comply with as set out in MPF 4? And if you're not so satisfied, it's not incumbent on the planning authority to take a punt and kick the cans down the road and condition this so that the detail comes later. There is a balance to be struck and in this particular case at this particular time, as the report I believe appropriately reflects, we don't believe there is sufficient information to allow the planning authority to discharge its function and take that decision and declare itself so satisfied because there be dragons in terms of a lot of the detail that would need to be forthcoming later. That's not to say that if some of that was addressed up front, and I, I, I appreciate it's each one in its own merits, you can make comparisons with the amount of information applicants generally submit for permission in principle, but you have to have regard to this particular site. And if the features of this particular site mean that there is a higher threshold to be crossed in terms of the information that's needed to take an honest and informed view in the matter, then that's the position we're presenting today on this one. It's each one in its own merits, and in conclusion, Chair and members, I would simply stand by and without being defensive and without overly relying on any one policy document, I would stand by the recommendation before you for the reasons set out at pages 85 and 86 and also fully summarised in detail at paras 1 to 11, pages 94 95 in the summary at the end. Thanks, Chair, members. Thank you, David. Uh, folks, it's over to you uh, for committee discussion and then ultimately determination. Are there any points you would like to be considered or anything to say? Councillor Cowan. Thank you, Chair. I think I've actually had the question in my head answered by the, the two last uh, speakers. I was actually going to ask about the planning and principle process um, and about the constraints, some of the, the the validity of the questions around the biodiversity and the geotech surveys and development of the Bing, whether those questions had to be answered at, at this stage while we're in plan principle, well, that would be picked up at a later stage. Um, I'm uncomfortable with some of the information that's in the report. I'm struggling to make an informed decision at this stage, so I'm looking for some advice on the process, um, what are the options? Do we have an option to recommend a continuation to some of these answers? Can be brought through further dialogue or what are the options in front of us today? Thank you. Sorry, this is a statutory process. It's a quasi-judicial process and the planning authority would, I think, require to determine this today based on the recommendations. And certainly there would be no obligation on any party to provide any further information at this stage. Clearly, if it was granted today, then officers would need to go away and look at the conditioning. If it was refused today, then subject to any appeal that might be exercised and any decision that might be taken in any appeal, then it wouldn't preclude the applicant, as members will be well aware, we're coming back with a fresh application that maybe addresses some of the gaps in information that we perceive to be there that inform the assessment we've presented in front of you. So continuation is an option, but only if we're clear, A, what further information is required, and B, that there's a likelihood that whatever party's been asked to provide it is able and willing to provide it in a reasonable timescale. 
Councillor Crawford. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I've heard all the, the objectors and I realise it's nature is a big popular thing in you. But for me, so is unemployment. Big factor in your area. Big factor for the barn, but the most it's ever employed since the pit shot. And I certainly hope that the outline planning permission will succeed. Well, we'll come to determination uh, once we've exhausted the discussion. Are, are there any other members um, uh, like to uh, make some comments? Councillor Watts. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've, I've gone backwards and, and forwards on this most of the week, um, looking at the reports, uh, the, the site visit yesterday. Um, I, I come down on, I think myself, on the side that I think the site would have major economic benefits, which in some ways outweigh um, the ecological concerns that have been put forward at the moment in my mind, um, bearing in mind that the plan is only in principle. I think these things can be sort of conditioned at a later stage once we have full planning permission. Um, the development undoubtedly, in my view, would be beneficial to the communities of Cumnor, Cockletree, Ockenleck, Mocklin and the surrounding area. With bringing in, um, you know, tourism and the potential of hundreds of jobs. So weighing up between the two, I am more than likely to suggest that the uh, committee would approve this application in principle. Okay, thanks. Billy, you got a legacy up there with your hand up. Right, no thanks. Council yeah, Lennox. Yeah. Thanks, Provost. Um, I mean, I've got to say, I'd be very supportive of uh, the concept that brings jobs to the area and uh, some economic development. That I just have a problem. Um, in terms of the, the Bing, I, I just don't think a Bing can sustain any development in terms of its stability. And I'd like to, I'm kind of with Councillor Cowan in the sense that um, I'd like to see some studies done in that Bing to see if it could, if it was feasible to, to put some structures on it. Um, I'm also sympathetic to the, to the environmental issues that would be raised there as well. I, I, I just don't feel well enough informed to, to be able to come to a decision today. Thanks, Provost. No, oh, thank you. Members, any other comments here? Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Chair. I don't think there's any of us councillors here who would um, like to stand in the way of such a project. However, what's presented in front of us today um, and are the potential impacts acceptable? I don't think the ecological impacts are acceptable and I am very concerned about the instability of the Bing and I, um, I, I think with what's in front of us today, we would have to refuse planning in principle, no matter how supportive we are of the project. OK, thank you. I'm going to ask anybody else if they want some comments. I will come back to, I think Councillor Cowan was uh, muted the, 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 the possibility of continuation for this, but we'll get some more advice on that before we go uh, to determination. Are there any other questions? Comments? Right, thanks. Uh, oh, David, is it possible? Um, is there no way or uh, can we ask for a continuation and ask those questions maybe that Councillor Lennox had asked? Chair, I can only say what I said a few moments ago. Apologies, but the bottom line is we would need any continuation. You need to be clear in the purpose. You'd need to be clear what further information is required. You'd need to be clear who it's required from and you'd need to know that they are in a position to provide it and in what time scale. That's the whole dialogue here. So my position is that 
the applicant has submitted everything they've submitted. You've heard the applicant's agent say they feel they've submitted more than they already need to. You've got a very detailed report and assessment. And fundamentally, in this instance, you've been asked to agree now, today, permission in principle to build in the bank. And there isn't any information in front of you. And that doesn't reflect on officers, it doesn't reflect on objectors, whether it reflects on applicants is for them to say. But you are being asked to grant planning permission in principle. And if you do that today, that bank will be built on, or will be capable of being built on. But we will only find out if it will be built on somewhere down the line. You will only find out somewhere down the line if it will be got any jobs whatsoever. What I said earlier was, and the planning agent's quite right for the applicant, it is always a matter of balance. But at the end of the day, just because it's in principle doesn't mean that the authority can take a light touch in the discharge of its function and its obligations as planning authority. So the question for everybody is, are you satisfied today that this site can be developed in the way that has been put forward? If you're not so satisfied, then the matter should be determined today and it can be determined today. If you wish for that information, I think we would need to have a conversation with the applicant as to what their willingness is and ability is to be able to produce that because I'm not clear what further information would be required. If it's just points of clarification, we can bring them back to the table today, amend the process and ask any simple questions today. If it's actually go and do the surveys on the Bing, etc., that's rewriting the planning process because that's what we come in at a later stage. If it's refused today, the applicant can come in again in principle or they can come actually come in for the full detail and produce the higher level and there's a lot more investment at that stage but they have options they also have the option to appeal if they feel that the decision to refuse if that was the decision today is an inappropriate one but fundamentally you're being asked to say today that that bank can be built on and there is no information whatsoever that it can or it can't that's as fundamentally as I can put it without trying to skew the consideration. That's what informs the recommendation. There are other elements you could come and go on, but the point I was trying to make earlier is if you take each issue and say, well, that could be conditioned and we could get that information later and you kick each can down the road, you'll get down the road and there'll be a big wall of cans. That's the whole point of the process now, but you need to be satisfied on what's in front of you that this development can be delivered before you give it and it can be delivered without any significant adverse impacts on ecology and environment. Everything that's set out in the pages are referred to. And if you're not so satisfied, then you should go with the recommendation. If on what's in front of you, you've taken a different view, then you can you can vote accordingly in that regard. But I think given the history of this, I think given the desire to get it to determination, the fact that we're looking at the December and January committees, I think subject to the view of any other party present, it would be incumbent and authority to deal with us today based on information in front of you. And as I say, it may be a decision in principle, but you still need to feel and be satisfied you have enough information available to take that decision in principle. And you've got a 94 page report that tells you there is no information about the developability of the bank. OK, thanks, folks. Uh, Councillor Crawford. Um, I'm going to move the motion uh, uh, that we accept the planning principle. I think the economical benefits or the threat or the promised economical benefits to our area is phenomenal. And I would hate to be the unit dump doing the amount of jobs in this area. So I'd be moving it. That's OK. We're at that stage now, folks. Uh, have you got a seconder, Billy? No. Yeah. Councillor Watts, do you want to speak? Um, yes, no, I'll, uh, Chair, I'll second Councillor Crawford, as I'd, I'd already intimated that uh, I would go with an approval. That's OK. Just, well, just as a point of clarification, can I just check then that the motion as seconded is in fact to uh, approve, but to remit to officers to uh, work up a, an appropriate set of conditions should the should the application be determined? Because at the moment you have a recommendation for refusal, so you have no proposed conditions in front of you. 
So the normal approach where if the committee is minded to go against the recommendation would also be include the remit because officers will now need to obviously, if it is approved, work up appropriate conditioning that will require all the further information to be provided that hasn't been provided so far. Yeah, I think Billy agrees with that. Put the thumbs yeah. up there. Yeah, thanks, Billy. Great. Well, I, I'd like to m move the recommendations. So that would be the amendment. Uh, the motions uh, for from Billy and Neil. The motions for acceptance. Uh, I would move as an amendment the recommendations in the papers. I'll second that. Councillor Friel seconds that. Thank you. Sorry, anybody otherwise minded? Okay, Claire's got a legacy up. No, Chair, it was actually to second. Apologies. No, no, it's okay. Thank you. And that is not that we're against the. No, 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 absolutely. No, Take your, your hand down. Information in front of us today. Sadly, uh, that it comes up against ecological issues, which is almost ironic. That's, but um, That's okay. You've you've got your hand up. That's all. That. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Members, in terms of um, the vote today, it will be by roll call. And for clarification, the motion is by Councillor Crawford, seconded by Councillor Watts, to move um, to grant approval due to the economic benefits and to remit to officers to. Um, work up the suggest, uh, uh, the planning conditions and the amendment is to move the recommendation for refusal as per the report and that's uh, proposed by the Provost and seconded by Councillor Friel. Councillor Maitland. The amendment. Provost Todd. Amendment. Councillor Friel. Amendment. Councillor Cowan. Amendment. Councillor Mackay. I need to support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Barton. Amendment. <laughs> Councillor Holland. Motion, please, thanks. Councillor Lennox. I'll support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Motion. Councillor Watts. Motion. Councillor Hogg. Amendment, please. Councillor Stewart. For the motion, please. Uh, members, um, we have six votes for the motion and six votes for the for the amendment. And in terms of our um, tie-in votes, it would be the chair's casting vote. Provost. Members to confirm the decision of the committee is that the application has been refused for the reasons detailed in the report. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Um, before we go on to the next part, if the guests that were here for this application would uh, like to leave or you can stay, it's entirely up to yourselves. But Robert will see you out if you need to go. The application uh, has been refused. Really do a right, thanks folks. Uh, moving on to the next item on the papers. Uh, and this is the application for a planning permission for the installation of a 20 metre high slimline monopole supporting six in number antennas, one in number wraparound equipment cabinet at the base of the monopole, one in number equipment cabinet, one in number electric meter cabinets, one in number transmission cabinet 
an ancillary development at the Grass Verge on <laughs> corner of Main Street, Galilee Avenue, Ocultry, Cumnock, Ayrshire, K182PG, and uh, application number is 22 oblique 0552 oblique PP. And I believe it's Vary again. Thanks, Provost. Yeah, I'm presenting again, but uh, Madeline here was the case officer for the report, so she might be able to help with some, some questions if there are any. OK, so moving on to slideshow. Hopefully I'll be able to share it all right this time. OK, yep, so just moving on to you, uh, you've had a description of the application already. <laughs> um, the application site is located to the western part of Ocaltree within a largely residential area. Uh, the application site is here, um, just shown by the kind of rectangular area right on the corner of Galilee Avenue and Main Street in Ocaltree. The application site, again, which is in this location here. I'll maybe just zoom in if I can. Hey, it's in this grass verge area here, which is within the conservation area of Ocaltree, uh, but right at its western edge. Uh, the boundary of the conservation area coincides with Galilee Avenue uh, on its um, western side. Uh, so this just shows some of the plans that have been submitted with the application. Um, this doesn't show anything in particular apart from the existing site here and the proposed access to it. Uh, this shows the existing uh, plan um, showing the bus shelter that's there um, and there is a planter as well. Uh, and this is the boundary of, this is a boundary wall along this location. Location. Um, this is the grass verge area uh, and there are mature trees along the, the boundary wall. Uh, an existing elevation which shows the bus stop and um, the bus stop post here, the bus shelter and the post. And the proposed plan, um, which I'll maybe just zoom into as well. Um, so you've got the three cabinets along here and the pole located in this at this point here, which is just to the side of the bus shelter. And an elevation of the proposed monopole, um, it's 20 metres high, it's a slimline pole. Um, you can see kind of the scale of it in relation to the bus shelter anyway. So this is looking at the application site from the west on Main Street. Um, as I've already said, the site is within that, the conservation area of Ocaltree. The pole would be located in around this area, if you could see my cursor, very small there, I think, um, just next to the bus shelter. Um, so the recommendation is to approve it. Um, and we do take account, obviously, the fact that it is within the conservation area, but it is at its edge and we don't think it materially affects the character and appearance of the main part of the conservation area, which we would consider to be beyond the wall and tree line further down uh, the main street. I'll move on to, to, to that a bit later as well. Um, so this is looking from the, the application site is on the right hand side, and this is looking towards the houses on Galilee Avenue and beyond. So we think the site is more associated with this housing development rather than the conservation area. And again, the application site, the pole would just be beyond the bus shelter. The pro proposed mast would en provide enhanced digital communications infrastructure to the benefit of residents and businesses within Ocaltree. The application site is located within the conservation area. However, it is not considered that proposal would result in an unacceptable impact on the character and appearance of the conservation area, primarily due to its location at the edge and out with the historic part of the conservation area. The location of the mass would also prevent views to it and from the conservation area and the backdrop of 
mature trees would also provide mitigation in the form of screening or softening of views of the mass from the waste. The application is therefore considered to be in accordance with the development plan, including MPF4. The material considerations, including the objections to the proposal, have all been taken into account. However, they are not considered to outweigh the development plan considerations. The application is therefore recommended for approval. Thank you. Thanks, Vary. Uh, over to members. Any questions, points? Councillor Watts. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm, unfortunately, I uh, must uh, disagree with the officers. Um, I think the visual impact of this mast at that point um, would just be uh, awful. And the fact that it is, even though just within the conservation area, um, is completely uh, out of character, in my view, um, with the local area. And for that reason, I would move refusal of this application. Thank you. I've got Councillor Friel and then Councillor Lennox. Barry, did you see the trees that are there? Is there any suggestion that any of those are going to be removed? There are no proposals or need to remove the trees. It's far enough away from them that there would be no impact. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Lennox, then Councillor Crawford. Thanks, Provost. Um, <clears throat> you need to forgive my naivety. I'm trying to um, comply based on the last planning meeting that I, went, uh, that I attended. I wasn't quoting the right information, but hopefully I can do it this time. I tend to agree uh, with Councillor Watts in this instance. Um, in, re in regards to uh, policy ENV3, which is in page 113, um, it states that the development of it should preserve and enhance its character and be consistent with relevant conservation area. I mean, even although it's on the edge of the conservation area, uh, technically speaking, it's still within the conservation area. Um, so to that end, I don't think it does comply uh, with ENV3. And similarly with OP1, section 3, um, I think it's that can be quite subjective. Um, and I, th I think that, that it would detract from the visual amenity uh, in, in the sense of that policy as well. So I would I would concur with uh, Councillor Watson second him in that. Uh, Thank you. To reject. Uh, uh, David, do you want to come in about those points? Is that OK? Um, yeah, if, if I could, thanks, uh, Provost. Um, just to, to touch on that, we have obviously provided our own explanation um, in terms of uh, where you referred us to there under um, ENV3. It refers you back to the consideration we give under um, Policy 7 of NPF4. Uh, um, now, to some extent, it's, it's reflective of similar type issues, um, and we have obviously set out there why we consider um, that it doesn't affect the character um, of the, the conservation area. Um, we fully understand it is within it. Um, but on a careful assessment of it, um, we feel as though that that line of trees um, and the first buildings is really the, the, the proper edge of that conservation area where the character would be affected um, and that what's actually happening uh, near that mast in terms of taller structures. Um, so trees, um, there's also a uh, telephone cables and, and the taller structures across the road um, that that in itself is enough to change the character of that part of the conservation area where it's not the historic core of the conservation area. Ultimately, that's a judgment call. I respect what your view is on that, um, but our judgment is that there is no unacceptable impact on the conservation area per the, the papers and, and obviously I support the, uh, what the officers have, have written there. No, thanks, David. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, absolutely. Council in it, yeah. Just to come back to that, um, similarly, I, I, I I fully respect the, the interpretation of officers as well. It was just that the on-site visit yesterday we noticed it was apparent that the, the community are doing their best to try and um, establish a conservation area type uh, with street furniture, etc. The, the lamp posts and the, the hanging baskets were all um, period kind of uh, equipment. Um, and I just feel that a, a 
mobile phone mast plonked in there just is totally out of character. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think uh, that's a, a fair uh, view. Uh, Councillor Crawford. Right, Chair, it's OK. Right, folks, we've had um, a, a motion, a proposal and seconded to uh, reject uh, the application. Uh, I would propose that I would go with the officers to support the application. Um, if there's no other uh, discussion and no other questions, um, if I don't get a second, then that's fine. But um, I'm happy to second. Uh, I'm happy to second, Chair. Right, thanks, Maureen. Um, does anybody else want to come in? If not, we're going to go to determination. Yeah, but Billy, you've still got a legacy up, is it? Sorry, it should be done. Yeah, thank you. Somebody else? Oh, yeah, that's it. Is that us? I don't think anybody else wants in. Sorry. Yeah, Councillor Hawke. Hawke. Yep, sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Sorry, Jennifer, we couldn't see. Councillor Hogg. Sorry about that. It's quite difficult where I am at the moment in the travelling. Just I did that site visit yesterday as well, and the close proximity of that mass to the houses was would be quite overpowering. And it is on the edge of the conservation of the village, and I do support what Councillor Lennox has already said. So I would be supporting um, Councillor Lennox on this one. OK, thank you. Anybody else? Right, we're OK. Going to go to determination. So again, the motion is to uh, reject the application and the amendment is to support. Thank you, Chair. Members, if you could confirm if you are for the motion or for the amendment, please. Can so, I apologise, Lee. Could you remind everybody that the motion, what the motion is and what the amendment is? Yeah, apologies, Sorry. Chair. Yeah, the motion um, is by Councillor Watt, seconded by Councillor Lennox to refuse the application. The amendment is by the Provost, seconded by Councillor Mackay to approve the application. Councillor Maitland. So, amendment, Lynn. Provost Todd. Amendment. Councillor Friel. Amendment. Councillor Cowan. Motion. Councillor Mackay. Uh, to support the amendment to approve the application. Thank you. Councillor Barton. Motion. Councillor Holland. Motion. Councillor Lennox. Motion. Councillor Crawford. Motion. Councillor Watts. Motion. Councillor Hogg. Motion. And just to confirm, members, Councillor Stewart has now left the meeting. Members, um, the motion has been carried by seven votes to four and the application has been refused. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Lynn. Um, that's refu refusal for that item. Now, folks, um, some advice from you guys. We've got a comfort break put in because the next application um, we said would start at half, half 12 for folk that want to look at that. So I'm going to propose that we have a break and if everybody could come back online and in the chambers for 25 past 12, if that's OK, gives us five minutes to get organised if there are any issues with online stuff. Is that OK, folks? Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Maitland. Present. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Provost Todd is in the chambers. Councillor Friel is in the chambers. Councillor Cowan is in the chambers. Councillor Mackay, you are online. Yeah, I am, yes. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Councillor Barton is in the chambers. Councillor Holland. 
Yeah, I'm online. Thank you. Councillor Lennox is in the chambers. Councillor Crawford. I left the meeting. Councillor Watts. Yeah, it's on here. Thank you. And Councillor Stewart had left the meeting earlier. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that, Lynn. Thanks, folks. We'll just go back into business. Um, the next item is the approval of matters specified in conditions three, site details, six design and setting, eight drainage, 13 earthworks, 14 suds and 15 flood route. This is of planning consent uh, number 10 oblique 0917 oblique PPP as extended by number 18 oblique 0561 oblique PP for the erection of residential development comprising 471 dwelling houses and associated infrastructure at North Craig Farm, Glasgow Road, Kilmarnock. And that's the reference number for this application is 22 oblique 0005 oblique AMC PPP. Thank you. And uh, we'll go over to Fiona for this one. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. The application is before committee today because it is a major development and under the Council scheme of delegation, it requires to be determined by the Planning Committee. Just before I outline the proposals to you and summarise the report, I'd like to give members some background to this site. This is an application for matters specified in conditions of a planning permission and principle, with planning permission and principle having been granted quite some years ago, as noted starting at paragraph six of your papers, and then was renewed to keep the principle of the development live. Together, the planning permission permission already granted and this application today, which relates only to design and layout matters, would make up the planning consent if granted by members. The site overall is primarily identified for residential development in the previous development plan and the current development plan now as the local development plan as a development opportunity site for residential purposes. Members are not therefore to here today to consider the principle of residential development on this land overall, as that matter has been determined already with the issuing of planning permission and principle. Members have, will have noted that some of the land to the southern area was a miscellaneous development opportunity site for a neighbourhood centre, but consent in that regard has now elapsed and the applicant has assumed the land into this proposal for residential development. The application site is located to the northern edge of Kilmarnock, to the north of the South Craigs residential development and is part of the last three phases of the North Craigs land release. The first phase is also being developed by the applicant and is currently on site and working to completion. This application will occupy the area of land in between that first phase and South Craigs. Therefore, we have a proposal before you today, members for 471 houses for the final phases of this overall site. It's a mix of detached, semi-detached and terraced units over an umbrella development by DW Homes and Barrett with 18 different house types as noted in paragraph 16. The site will be accessed primarily from the new Spine Road, which already has planning permission, and in terms of the public open space, there will be three formal children's play areas, community parkland with trim trail, linear park along the Spine Road, community fruit orchard and landscape buffers, plus three suds ponds. I'm just going to turn to the screens now, members, and just run through some plans for you. OK, uh, here within the red line site is the application site for today's application. This area to the north that you can hopefully see here where the cursor is, um, is just showing you the current site that's being built out by the applicants at the moment. Um, to the south of site members running along here, you'll see the existing residential properties that comprise South Craigs with the South Craigs Spine Road known as South Craigs Drive running along here members. And obviously you have Glasgow Road that takes you up towards M77 and Dromallen Business Park and the Spine Road members for this application takes you from the roundabout here at South Craigs Drive along this road to meet into the application site. At this a little bit more detail members again just a red line site um, showing you the, the, the application plan that's submitted by the applicant. This is the, the development layout members that you can see. You can see here the Spine Road coming in and you can see access at South Craigs Drive. You can see the existing residential development up here that is planned for build out and is currently being worked on at the moment, as I've said to you. So we have the spine road here. We have a phase of development up here and we have the other phases in here, members. You'll see the um, landscape along the spine road and you'll see the landscape corridors to create path networks, etc. through the development. You'll have, I'll show you in a bit more detail in a second, but you have one play area up here. You have another play area in up here and another play area around here, members. You have the suds, 
to three. You have the um, trim trail and the community parkland here. And there's a little bit more details coming up, members, on the trim trail um, design, etc. OK, uh, again, just a bit later, but focusing really on the green spaces members and the and the structural planting around the boundary of the site here, members that you can see that goes right round the proposed development. Um, you can see the sort of little green spaces that are proposed. You can see the linear park area there along the spine road. You can see the play areas, larger areas of landscaping and the community park down here. This just gives you a wee bit of detail of these areas um, and a bit more information. Down here at the south um, west corner of the site is the trim trail with Suds Pond area there and you can see the sort of landscape grass area and you can see the other Suds Ponds details there members with the path networks etc around and how they're set within the landscaping. Again just the play park and the, um, the linear park. The, sorry the linear park alongside the spine road and the community woodland areas. Uh, this is just a little bit of information members on the play parks. You can see the different ages of the play park groups and you can see the trim trail down the bottom members using kind of natural materials um, to try and um, encourage children just for natural different types of play rather than just with play equipment. And you can see the play equipment that's proposed in the other areas in terms of age appropriate. Uh, moving on to some house types, just a selection of the house types members so that you can see here we have some semi detached. Uh, detached. The range of house types members for you. We do tend to put quite a few of them up, these up so, so you can see them for yourselves. Uh, this is just the local development plan as it stands at the present time. Um, you've got the 2017 local development plan, so you have the red, the sort of orangey colour here is the residential layout. <coughs> Excuse me, members, I might got start, keep coughing throughout this. Um, and then you have the, the former um, site for the old neighbourhood centre down the bottom there, members. Um, just some photos, the really generally these comprise views across the site. Um, these are looking back towards South Craigs. It's such a large expanse of, of, of fields members that we've just really shown you um, various perspectives and views today. That's just the, um, the, the sort of northern area that's just being developed at the moment. So that's looking back towards Glasgow Road members. Uh, that's looking north just towards the um, development that's being built out at the moment. You can see some of the construction equipment over there. <sighs> Uh, this is just South Craig's Drive members um, from the, the kind of access point looking north. Right, I'm going to try and work out how to stop the show. If anybody wants to see anything else, please just let me know and I can put anything back up for you that we need to do. OK, so back to the report. Um, consultations are summarised in your report. We have no issues from consultees comprising ARA in terms of traffic and flooding, SEPA who have liaised with the developer over a considerable period of time, Scottish Water, Coal Authority, Scotland Gas Networks, Health and Safety Executive, Education, Environmental Health and Countryside Access Officer. We do have objections from the NHS and Public Health, however as per your report I do have to advise you members that as per page 137 in response to paragraphs 29 and 30 that we are not here to consider the principle of housing as the site has been through the local de development plan, local plan and the local development plan adoption when NHS were consulted and engaged with via this adoption process. Noting also members that it has planning permission in principle for residential use, the local development plan for the site had an indicative capacity of 600 units. points made by the health bodies therefore do not warrant refusal of the application. Turning to the letters of representations, we have 23 individual representations. The points are raised are summarised and responded to starting at paragraph 37 on page 143 of your report. In brief, the issues cover flooding, drainage and suds, 
traffic and transport, noise and construction impacts, impacts on wildlife, on amenities and services, privacy, security and general amenity issues such as lo loss of light and overshadowing, affordable housing consents, house types, levels, pedestrian links, open space factoring and landscaping. Section 25 and 37 2 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act require that planning applications be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. As we've just heard earlier today, it's NPF 4, which was adopted by the Scottish Ministers earlier this week, and the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan that are relevant to this application as comprising the development plan. The policies of both have been considered in detail, with the report with the prevailing of NPF 4 also explained to you members as appropriate. The application is actually considered to be contrary to parts of Policy Res 1 and OP1 in the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan 2017, but such non-compliance is not considered to be sufficient that the development as a whole could not be described as being compliant with the development plan. There are material considerations relevant to this application, and in terms of planning history in particular, these have been assessed and on balance consider suggest approval of the application. In this regard, members will note that the southeastern part of the Red Line site is, regard is located within a safeguarded miscellaneous opportunity under the provisions of the 2017 plan. Proposed residential development on this part of the site is deemed to be contrary in part of Res 1 and OP1. However, with regard to public open space, I can confirm that INF 4, that confirm that under INF 4, the proposal seeks to deliver all open space, whether, and is it, whether it is amenity or recreational. And as demonstrated on the plan and back to your, in the back of your report, in amenity open space, the applicant is required to provide 9,420 square metres, but is providing 26,260 square metres. Recreational open space, the applicant is required to provide 29,673 square metres, but is providing 31,500 square metres. It's also undoubtedly the case that it must be taken in context when assessed against the benefits of the proposal for East Ayrshire and its local community. With me, one members, that the principle of residential development in the miscellaneous opportunity site has been established through the outline planning consent um, in 2018. The master plan that formed part of the planning permission and principle for 2018 envisages that the residential the, the opportunity next opportunity site be developed for residential use. In addition to the above, the policies of the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan are on the whole otherwise complied with, and likewise the policies of the National Plan Planning Framework are complied with. As indicated in the report, there are material consider considerations relevant for the application, and it's considered on balance that these are largely supportive. The proposed development can be satisfactorily accommodated within the site, and it can offer gains in biodiversity, resulting in an attractive site, and will add to the existing housing offer of Kilmarnock and overall East Ayrshire. In assessing the application, a primary consideration has been whether there would be significant adverse impacts on residential amenity and on the amenity of the area. It's not considered that the proposed residential development will detract from the Kilmarnock settlement boundary within which it's located or nearby property. Taking a balanced judgment, it's not considered that the effects on neighbouring residential amenity from noise nuisance, overlooking or privacy would be significantly adverse to justify the refusal of planning permission. Given the nature of the proposal, it's unlikely to generate excessive noise or types of noise that would be odds at the existing residences in the vicinity. On a more detailed level, the site is planned at a density typical of a modern residential development and noting the over excessive over provision of public open space with no detrimental significant impacts expected in terms of overlooking a privacy either within the site or in terms of the relationship with proposed units of proposed units with existing houses. In these circumstances and balancing any potential impacts against community need, it's considered that the application can be supported. Consultation responses, as I've explained to you, are largely supportive other than the NHS and have clarified those matters in this presentation for you earlier members. And we feel that there are no matters that cannot be controlled via planning conditions. We have noted the 23 representations and consider that none of the application, none of the matters raised are of sufficient weight to warrant refusal of the application. Taking account of everything suggested above and within your report, it's concluded that the application, whilst contrary to some parts of the East Ayrshire Local Development Plan, overall remains compliant with the development plan being NPF 4 and LDP, and that the material considerations also suggest approval. In conclusion, it's recommended that the application be approved with conditions, but the decision notice is not issued until the 75 legal agreement is updated via administrative agreement to incorporate the current application in the decision. Chair. Thank you very much, Fiona, uh, for that in-depth report. And I'm going to open it up now. Uh, there are no objectors here, so we haven't got a hearing process. So I'm going to open it up to members for discussion or any questions to Fiona. Members. 
Councillor Barton, then Councillor Cowan. Thanks. It's just a, a clarification. There's 471 homes in this development, not a single social affordable house. And I appreciate there was a meeting the 23rd of April 2021 where the, that was removed. It's just a good clarification how we came to that point. Uh, this application um, originally, it's, it, it is in the report, but I appreciate there's quite a lot of information in the report. Um, this application originally came forward in 2010 when there was no affordable requirements through the local development plan. It was only due a matter of circumstances that then affordable housing came in with the 2017 local development plan. However, um, planning committee considered the report um, a few years ago now, obviously, and determined that we could set aside the affordable housing in terms of viability, and that is in accordance with the supplementary planning guidance of the local development plan from 2017. Mm -hmm. So that decision has already been taken. Yep, so there's no way to revisit that. It's just... Apologies, no, we can't. We've made that decision with planning committee. I do apologise. Fine, fair question. Uh, Councillor Cowan, then Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, thank you, Fiona. I'm just wondering about the, the potential for the landscaping buffering on the, the southern side of the site. Do any of your images highlight that? And can you give us a bit more detail on what could be conditioned in that area? We have conditions um, relative to a landscaping plan that's to come in. Condition 218. Um, we don't have any images at the moment, I'm afraid, that I can show you in detail, but we are proposing to deal with it by Condition 3, which says full details of a landscaping scheme um, for all areas of landscaping, communal areas, recreation, open space and amenity open space to be submitted before any works commence. Um, part of that includes the play areas, it includes the tree planting along the spine road, and it will also include the, the, the structural planting around the boundary. That condition also includes details about implementing and phasing of the landscaping, so we know how the landscaping and everything will be phased as the houses are built. And that condition also includes details of maintenance, so that we know exactly how all the, all the landscape areas public open space areas, shall we say, are to be maintained as well. And it's all through that. It's page 218. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have got some specific questions just again on uh, the landscaping, the boundaries, uh, if there have been changes to the landscaping plans from what was initially expected. Uh, also, just to ask about suds ponds, because again, in the photograph that you showed us, I know that there have been lots of residential complaints and concerns about how that sud pond has been maintained, in contrast to how the sud pond uh, going into the new North Craig's development on the right hand side has been maintained. So just to ask for some clarification, uh, if we can have any impact at this stage on uh, future planting, future plans for maintenance for suds uh, ponds that are within the development. Uh, then also just to express, I am aware of really quite significant flooding in garden grounds uh, round about the, the Fair Isle area of the development. So just to ask for some clarification on that. And then just going back again, I think to Councillor Barton's point, uh, just for some clarification, I think my recollection was that there was a an opportunity for affordable housing to have been considered as part of this site, but in actual fact, uh, East Ayrshire Council said that the proximity of the site to other services didn't meet its 20 minute neighbourhood requirement, and therefore we would not be looking to pursue uh, affordable housing. So just for some clarification, uh, if my recollection of that's correct, please. That That's all my questions, Fiona. I'm happy to come in if you need clarification on any of them. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, thanks very much, Councillor Mackay. Um, 
I'll probably go to the last one first, actually, um, in terms of affordable housing. That's also my recollection, but I couldn't find the copy of the correspondence that told me that. So I went with what was on the committee report in terms of the timing of the development. But that was my informally my recollection that housing in terms of the location of where we are, um, we're obviously also pursuing the application and the, the, the provision of affordable housing. However, um, it is quite clear in the committee report that the viability test was met. Um, and in terms of the SG supplementary guidance, sorry, for affordable housing, it met the terms of that. And in discussions with our policy colleagues, um, the application was presented for approval to forego the affordable housing. But I do understand and I do recollect that as well myself. I just couldn't find the copies of the emails that I had to, to confirm that. In terms of landscaping, um, maybe you could clarify for me just a wee bit more about what you were looking to ask. I'm not sure if there's much more I can add to Councillor Cowan's, mm -hmm. the response I gave to Councillor Cowan about landscaping, um, just in terms of the conditions that we have there to get full details of how the site's to be maintained um, through factoring arrangements, obviously, and um, the provision of the actual landscaping details that's to come through as part of the formal landscaping plans. I don't know if there's anything you can give me that before we okay. look at I, the suds I, and floods flooding. Right, OK, thank you. Uh, my understanding is that there were some expectations that the boundary space in actual fact that would be there it's actually at the the bottom i think of the what's in front of us on the screen would actually be wider uh would actually be wider in terms of the differentiation between what effectively is now South Craigs and what will be the new North Craigs development. So the expectation was that that area of ground would actually be a, a wider strip separating out. OK, thank you. I, I'm not aware of that, to be honest. Um, the, the stretch that we have there, I don't have a scale plan on me, I'm afraid to measure it, but the stretch that we have there, um, we do have some references to property distances, etc. within the report starting at page 173, etc. Um, but the distances that we have, the, the, the depth of structural planting that we have there, we do feel is sufficient to to give that still give identity to South Craigs, still give identity to North Craigs, and obviously to create an appropriate buffer based on all the amount of landscaping that's around there altogether. Um, I'm not aware of it, that it originally was meant to be any deeper than that, I'm afraid. I, I can't give you that commitment. OK, I think the concerns are that uh, that when that be pr prior to this area being developed, in actual fact, that it provided a fair degree of security because, as you have said, when you've gone through your presentation, the actual scale of it was so widespread that actually to get from any roads actually to be having proximity with the backs of properties existing in South Craigs was actually quite a trek for people. The concern is that what we have got now is we have got actually very short distances. So the concerns are over security, Fiona. So again, just for clarification in terms of is there anything that we can strengthen about that planting and that perhaps goes on top of what Councillor Cowan has said to ensure that we just are able to maintain that feeling of security for existing people in South Craigs. I think when we come through the conditions um condition number three, when we get the details for condition number three, we will see the final planting proposals and we'll be able to look at what, what sort of the level of planting, the density of planting, etc. To, to give a good ambience to the area, but also to give the security that you're looking for. Maybe that would be the solution is that we, we look at it through that and the condition, because the condition is quite clear that it's all landscaping areas and that includes structural planting as well. So I would expect to see a quality landscaping scheme coming through as part of condition three. OK, well, let's look at and see if there's perhaps a, just a change in wording in relation to that. But thank you for now. OK, no problem. In terms of Suds Ponds, um, I've maybe forgotten exactly where we were going with this. I do apologise. I've got the screen up just now. We've got three mm -hmm. Suds Ponds on the screen just now. Yes. Um, there are conditions there about maintenance, etc. And they will have to obviously look at being whether they're being adopted to Scottish Water, etc. Um, other than that, there's probably not much else I can tell you in terms of Suds. Um, I'm not sure whether Kevin come in with anything in terms of Suds either, but certainly 
it would be for the developer to make sure these were adopted um, through Scottish Water. And I can see the developer nodding at the back of the room, given that I've just caught his eye. So whether that might give you a little bit of comfort there, Councillor um, Mackay, in terms of the three suds ponds that are proposed. Well, my expectation, my expectation would be, and I'll be happy to be corrected, that Scottish Water would be interested in the actual whether or not the sud ponds were operating as sub ponds and doing their job effectively or not. There are concerns I know from local residents uh, existing at the moment in terms of we see some sud ponds that look more manicured, I think is probably the best phrase in some areas than in other areas. And my question was really, is there anything that we can do at this stage within planning to actually determine what the actual composition layout or planting is of those sud ponds to ensure that residents going forwards are more likely to be satisfied with the visual appearance of the sud ponds than they are against the one that you gave us a very good picture of, uh, which is from the existing South Craig's development. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Apologies, I understand. Um, I think the landscaping scheme again will will come round for the boundaries of the Suds Pond, the outerlying areas um, that, that bound the actual pond area. So we would deal with that as part of an approved landscaping scheme once we get one, should members decide that they're granting consent, obviously. And again, could you just direct me to which condition number you would see that specifically under? Landscaping scheme I would deal with under condition three. Deal um, under condition three. Page okay. 218. I okay. would take any landscaped areas that are to be maintained um, as, as under condition three. Okay, but I see that there is no direct reference within that to Suds Ponds. No, the but there is the landscaping that surrounds the Suds Ponds, which is, is marked out on the plan that I have on the screen at the moment. Yeah. Um, you can see the darker areas round about, the darker yeah. green areas. Um, that's the areas that would be covered by the, 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 the public open space elements. OK, could I ask, please, if you could take us to that photograph? Uh, I think it was the first photograph that you had on. Yep, just bear with me. Uh, I think that will be just before I do move off this map, Councillor. That would be the Suds Pond, Suds Pond excuse me, Suds Pond where the cursor is. Yep. yep. OK. Yep. OK, so that again would what you are proposing at condition three uh, leave us with what we have visually on the screen in front of us? Certainly within the Suds Basin, um, there's not much I can do in terms of landscaping what's in the Suds Basin, but certainly the area round about. So the area round about, that, that Suds Pond would be part of a larger landscaped area. If I can refer back to the plan. Hold on. Um. Fiona, sorry to interrupt. I think then the question becomes if it's not through condition three, could condition three deals with the ex outer areas of the suds? I think we need to clarify for members by what process and at who say so the actual content of the sud and the look and the design of the suds itself and any landscaping that isn't in our control. If we could maybe focus on who where, where responsibility would sit for the rest of the scheme. Thank you, that's helpful. To me, that would be with Scottish Water once the Suds Pond was, Suds Pond was adopted, what was in within the basin. I think then in terms of jurisdiction, we need to be clear on what the Council's planning authority could condition, and I think we have that clarity. It would be the landscaping scheme so far as it covers round the edges of the Suds, but for clarity, the actual sign off on the suds design and any element of the suds itself sits with Scottish water. So it's not what we can condition. What the council could do at best then, and correct me if I'm wrong, colleagues, would be to make our position known to the developer and Scottish water as to what we might be looking for. But at the end of the day, it's for Scottish water to sign off on that scheme rather than the council's plan authority. Is that correct, Fiona? I would agree with that. Thank yes. you. Thank you. That's all very helpful.
Okay, Maureen, is that you just now? Uh, yes, I think that was the areas covered. Uh, other than uh, Fiona, do you feel that you've addressed the security issues in with the landscaping scheme? Yes, I do. And my then my final question was in relation to the significant, and indeed it is significant, as in requiring sandbanks, it, uh, sandbags in the area of uh, part of the edge to edge development, which is around Fair Isle Place, that sort of area. I know there is significant runoff and I know there are concerns about drainage. Again, I'll be happy to be directed to conditions uh, from that. Thank you. I, I think that's covered. Um... Councillor, just by um, on page one four four on to one four five, where the residents have raised that as part of their objections, and what we've advised in response is that with regards to drainage and flooding, the applicant has submitted detailed drainage plans, overland flow plat, flow path plans, technical data, and information um, to advise that the the proposed development has been designed to avoid flood list, flood excuse me flood risk. And regard to flooding, there's been extensive discussions with both flooding. ARA flooding and SEPA who have no objections on flood grounds and by its very nature on page 145 we've advised that the proposed development will seek to reduce levels of surface water impacting on existing residential properties to the south of the site by the drainage proposals that are part of the application and would be part of the approved plans. Okay. And given that that has been agricultural land Fiona in the past and obviously there would have been some field drainage in, could I ask your understanding of how that relates into the developers proposed change in terms of drainage of the site? Um, sorry, I was just talking to one of my colleagues there. I, I don't have that technical qualification to advise you in that amount of detail, Councillor Mackay. What I do have to advise you is that this has been through discussions with um, ARA flooding as our local flood prevention authority, SEPA, in terms of their national flood requirements and the details and plans that we have are considered by both organisations to be sufficient in terms of addressing matters with surface water. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, advice uh, routes here. Uh, David first, then Kevin. Hey, thanks, Provost. Um, Councillor Mackay, it's just to add to, to what Fiona said, and I, I fully endorse what she said, but hopefully it gives you a bit of comfort that you know, you're saying that there's existing field drainage, um, but the residents still have impacts uh, from water, so clearly that field drainage isn't particularly adequate for them. Um, this is a, a large scheme that's got a highly managed drainage network. Um, we've got sign off from SEPA. I, and uh, colleagues in the ARA. Um, there's such points to control um, water and so on. I would fully expect that, that this should really be an improvement um, on any problems um, at the moment. Um, so it's really just to, to hopefully give you a bit of comfort there and just to really reinforce um, what Fiona said. OK, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Kevin. Through you, Chair, um, our flooding officer is obviously content with the proposals and would have taken field drainage into account when he was discussing the matter. Thank you. Again, Kevin, thank you. OK, thanks. Uh, Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just a question for Kevin. Really looking for clarification. Um, with so much more traffic on the road and trying to give um, as, as much since the can and walking these days, will the roads be 20 miles an hour? Thank you. Through you, Chair, yeah, they will be within the residential area. Could I just come back then? Is yeah, there... absolutely, yeah. Maybe I'm missing some. The, the spine road is still 20 miles an hour, is that correct, Jess? No, the, the the spine road will be the, the the normal speed limit, but the the residential streets within that development will be twenty mile an hour. Okay, I just wondered with so many pathways going onto the spine road, would it be consider taking it down to twenty miles an hour at all? That's something I would need to discuss with the traffic officers. 
Okay, she said, I thought in terms of safety and movement, it might it might be an idea with so many pathways connecting onto it. Thank you. Yep, absolutely fine. Uh, Maureen, you've still got a hand up. Is it a legacy? Oh, sorry, it is. Apologies. No, no, thank you. That's OK. Um, somebody else in? Uh, no, it was Councillor Maitland's here. That's great. Thanks. Uh, for myself, Fiona, may I ask a couple of things? Um, and it was about the, the there's mines. Obviously, there's mines everywhere. We get that. And I know the developers are really uh, aware of this. But the, the mine part, there's no objection now. <laughs> Uh, a survey has to be done, I would imagine. Uh, are we comfortable with that? And also, uh, the mine gas, has a survey been done about mine gas uh, escape? And if there is, can it be mitigated um, uh, during building or afterwards? Uh, also, um, it, some of the objections that were, were, were put in were saying that some of the houses were too close together in terms of uh, window to window. Uh, are we comfortable that, uh, that that's not the case and it should be OK? And uh, some comfort for that would be good. Thank you. Certainly not a problem, um, Provost Todd. Um, we have a response from the Coal Authority on page 132, paragraph 27, who withdrew their objection and advised that they were now satisfied with the information that the applicant had submitted. Um, they had originally objected, um, as you can see in, in the text, but now they are content with the proposals in terms of mine workings and also in terms of, of mine gas. And you'll see that the applicant submitted um, a ground investigation report and obviously on page 133, just above paragraph 28, advised that there was no issues, um, no evidence of any issues with regards to mine gas. In terms of distances to existing houses, yes, we have looked at that in, in an incredible amount of detail. And you'll see it starting at page 173, the, the case officer in writing the report has actually drafted in a fair amount of detail the distances to the properties, all of which are well above the um, existing minis, min, minimum industry standards. Um, if there's anything else, please don't hesitate to ask. No, no, that's absolutely fine. That's great to that clarified. Members, are there any other questions, comments? See anybody giving some time there? Guys, we'll go to determination. Um, I would like to propose the recommendations as laid down with uh, any conditions that officers feel are necessary. Councillor Friel, second, thank you. Are there any other uh, proposals? Could I, sorry Chair, could, could I possibly just ask for that uh, Add on, I don't know whether it would be a condition or whether it would be an advisory note. And that was in relation to the issues about the, the suds ponds and the overall finish and maintenance uh, of suds ponds. I think uh, David indicated that that would be possible to do uh, to ensure that developer and Scottish Water were aware of sentiments that we had against that. Yeah, Chair, just yeah. members to you, just to confirm if that is the agreed will of the committee, I would suggest we add that to the minute and therefore the committee's ask and position is recorded and then on the back of it being minuted, then officers of the council will put that formally in correspondence to both the developer and we will make that position known to Scottish Water, noting, noting that all we can do is pass on the reasonable request that the reasonable consideration be given to the aesthetics of the Suds Pond, noting that it's maybe just me, but to my understanding, Scottish Water are much more focused on the effectiveness and the operational capacity of the Suds Pond. But as we said, it's not in our jurisdiction. But if the committee makes the particular point, we will make that point on behalf of the committee. The developers are sat in the back of the room, so I don't think the point will be lost in them, but we'll write to them just in case. And uh, we will also, uh, when the time comes, we will write to Scottish Water as planning authority, passing on the view of the committee that having regard to the Suds Pond that is there, I think what's been said 
is it would be desirable if the next one or ones uh, came to a better finish than the one that's there at the moment and we'll put it probably much better than that because the planners are very good at that but we will do that on the back of the minute so I would say it's an additional recommendation from the committee that alongside the decision and the conditioning as set out we make that additional ask recognising it as an ask rather than a, a requirement. Well, thanks, David. Function and form can go hand in hand. <laughs> so I'm happy uh, with that recommendation, Maureen. It, certainly, yes, I accept that. And I think that's helpful that we always have that in the minute of this committee. Thank you. Right, thanks, folks. We've had a proposal and we've had a seconder. Do we accept the recommendations? OK, thank you very much, Lynn. Yep, thank you, Chair. The decision of the committee is that the application has been approved as per the report with an, ad an additional recommendation with regards to um, contacting both the developer and Scottish Water with regards to the aesthetics and maintenance of the Suds Ponds. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, guys. You're free to leave at the moment if you would like. <laughs> thank you. We'll get through as quickly as we can. Still got some business. And the next item is an application for approval of matters specified in conditions of a planning permission for the discharge of condition number 8A, details of bond of planning permission number 19 oblique 0262 PP at land at Deardorff Hill C7 Dunlop, Neilston from the A735 near Dunlop to East Renfrewshire boundary, Dunlop East Ayrshire. The number is 23 oblique 0013 oblique AMCPP. And this is over to Vary. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> yep, this application is for the discharge of Condition 8A of the planning permission granted for Daredoff Quarry, which requires details of the financial guarantee to be put in place to cover the site's restoration. Daredoff Quarry was approved by the Planning Committee on the 19th of March 2021 and granted planning permission in May 2022 following the conclusion of a Section 75 obligation. The site is located off the C7 Dunlop to Nielsen Road. As noted within the report, the applicant proposes a performance bond with a value of £244,370. This value is an increase, increase in what was estimated within the March 2021 committee report, mainly due to inflation and increased fuel costs, etc. The applicant's assessment of the value has been reviewed by the Council's independent compliance monitoring consultants and all parties are in agreement with this figure. It is therefore recommended that the committee approve the details submitted. Thank you. Thanks, Vary. Members? OK, the recommendations. Yep, we'll accept that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vary. Next item is planning application number glasses on 21 oblique 0007 S36 VAM. This is submission for approval in relation to condition number 12, 1, financial guarantee of planning consent number 19 oblique 0001 oblique S36 VAR at Penclow Wind Farm south of New Cumnock. And Graham. this is Graham. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Provost. Uh, afternoon, councillors. Uh, this is an application for approval of matters specified in planning conditions relating to condition 12, part 1 of deemed planning consent 19 slash 0001 slash S36 VAR, which was for the Penclough Section 36 Variation Wind Farm uh, located at Penclough Farm to the south of New Cumnock, just off the Afton Road. Under the Council scheme of delegation, committee approval is required by a condition imposed on a grant of planning permission to discharge conditions relative to the requirement for a financial guarantee to be provided to secure the decommissioning, restoration and aftercare of the development. The planning service consulted with the Council's consultees, Ironside Farrer Limited, who advised us in respect of the costs required for undertaking decommissioning, restoration and aftercare on the site. 
the planning service required a financial guarantee quantum of £3,585,239 to ensure site restoration should the operator fail to do so. The applicant has agreed with this figure. The applicant proposes to provide the financial guarantee by way of a bond, which is of medium risk to the Council, and both the Chief Governance Officer and Head of Finance have confirmed that the risk is acceptable, um, as is the quantum of the financial guarantee, given it reflects the value assessed by Ironside Farrah. Therefore, in terms of the requirements of Condition 12 Part 1, the applicant is to provide, prior to the commencement of development, details of the bond or other financial guarantee to cover the costs of decommissioning, restoration and aftercare of the site. We have been provided with details as to the value of the financial guarantee, which is acceptable to the Council, and we also know the financial guarantee will be by a bond, which is also of acceptable risk to the Council. As required under Part 2 of Condition 12, the applicant will require to deliver to the Council the bond and the planning authority will require to confirm in writing that it is satisfactory, but at this point in time the bond hasn't yet been delivered. Uh, ordinarily, under the Council scheme of delegation, the member's approval would be required in respect of Part 2 of Condition 12, also as it relates to the condition relative to the requirements for a financial guarantee to be provided to secure the decommissioning, restoration and aftercare of the development. As detailed in the report and the recommendations, Members are also being asked to agree to allow for the approval of Part 2 of Condition 12 under delegated powers upon submission of the signed bond by the applicant, provided it is in the form and to the specification as approved under Part 1. Therefore, in terms of the requirements of Condition 12 Part 1, and for the reasons set out in the report, it is recommended that the application be approved, and it is also requested that members also agree to allow the approval of Condition 12 Part 2 under delegated powers upon receipt by the Council of the bond, provided that such approval is in line with what has been presented under part one of the condition. Thank you. Great, thank you. Members, any comments, questions? We're OK, go with the recommendations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We're good with that, Lynn. Yep. Uh, item 8 is a compliance monitoring update of major environmental developments in East Ayrshire, pages 242 to 272 of your papers. Yes. Graham again. Yeah, so the, that's right. Uh, so the compliance report provides an update on major environmental developments, including open cast coal restoration sites, quarries, landfill, onshore wind farms and electrical infrastructure projects during, the, during their construction, operational and restoration phases. Uh, the report covers the period from the 1st of October 2022 to the 31st of December 2022. Appendices 1 to 8 provide the detail of each of the developments and the report provides a summary of the main points. In terms of open cast coal sites, uh, this report notes that no further restoration works have taken place during the reporting period at Greenburn. At House of Water, site clearance works are ongoing with the removal of plant and infrastructure. Ongoing soil remediation is taking place, uh, though the importation of soil and ground enhancement measures will be regulated by SEPA, with the Planning Authority having no role in that process. I'll show a couple of slides up here for you. Uh, so this is House of Water, the former office area, and you can see some vehicles just in sort of middle ground there. Uh, they'll be removed as well in due course. And again, just another view of the former workshop area. So obviously things are looking quite cleared up there at the moment. And in terms of open cast restoration projects, uh, there is no further update in respect of the Council's restoration projects. These projects have almost been completed with the exception of a further phase of restoration uh, planned at Chamerston. In terms of onshore wind farms, uh, the Council currently has two wind farms under construction, both of which are being monitored by planning enforcement officers. Uh, South Kyle wind farm infrastructure works are almost complete with restoration of borrow pits and other temporary construction areas ongoing. Turbine deliveries continue and within the reporting period, 20 turbines have been erected within East Ayrshire, with a further 11 installed to mid-tower level. 
a number of the members attended a visit to see the South Kyle Wind Farm project in December 2022. <laughs> and I think we'd agree it was a useful visit and certainly helped to see the progress that's been made um, up to that point on the site. Uh, compliance has generally been good, with some issues of runoff noted, as well as some peat handling, which are currently being monitored. No issues have uh, merited any formal enforcement action uh, to be taken. Uh, as noted in paragraphs 18 and 19 of the report, the developer is in discussion with the Council regarding features considered to be temporary uh, to determine a restoration solution for these areas, and is hoped agreement will be reached within the coming months. Uh, regarding additional forestry tracks and crossing points, which have been formed uh, for future forestry use, not forming part of the approved plan, this has been raised as a compliance issue, and the developer has been asked to submit applications to regularise these works. And again, just got some slides here from South Kyle. Uh, so this is just Spur 15, an additional drainage channel that's been installed, uh, just where the cursor is there. Yeah, that's a little bit of peat slippage at water crossing six, uh, but again, that's being monitored. And again, that's just a view of some turbine components awaiting um, installation on the site, presumably waiting for better weather. Uh, Snedden Law as well as another of our wind farms. Um, all site tracks now have almost been completed. Uh, the site has now been handed over to the principal contractor. Uh, the control building at that site uh, compound is now partially complete and this construction of hard standing areas and turbine base excavations is underway with concrete pours, uh, yeah, concrete pours commencing imminently. There have been no issues uh, with raised which would warrant enforcement action on Snedden Law site either. Um, whilst I didn't attend the Snedden Law visit myself, I know a number of the members also attended that site visit uh, to see how the progress was being made in a similar manner to the visit arranged at South Kyle. And again, these are some photographs from Sned Law. Uh, that's a control building you can see in the picture there, which is prob probably almost complete by now. Uh, that's just some coir matting and a silt dam there just to help filter sediment in the water course. That's peat spreading there. You can see the dark area where the cursor is. That's just peat being spread for habitat management purposes. And that's just turbine five, the steelwork complete, ready for concrete pours for the foundation of the turbine. Uh, Whiteley, paragraph 20 of the report notes the continued delay in the conclusion of the bond review. It is noted that officers have made contact with the relevant operator, uh, operator's contacts and currently await their up-to-date position, although note that the operator agrees that the, the bonds require to be updated. In terms of the South West Scotland connection project, restoration has continued mostly successfully, as noted in paragraphs 26 to 33 of the report, uh, with restoration on part B, which is the new Cumnock substation to the Black Hill substation, noted as having been having taken place to a very high standard. And again, these are just some of the slides from uh, the restoration project. Uh, that's uh, Parry Burn, nor the north bank of Parry Burn before. And that's how it's looking now. So you can see the, the restoration works and the vegetation have established quite nicely. So it's certainly an improved picture. And again, that's just some regrading of the slope to the rear of Tower D30, which is currently being undertaken. Uh, so the recommendation is that members note the content of the report and note that no formal action has been taken or warranted during that period. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Councillor Field, yeah. Colin, I have been asked by constituents to say that there has been an increase of heavy traffic from the A77 through the villages of Muscari and Waterside, much of it depositing stone along the road, small windstone or something in, along the road, and they're not happy about the increase of the heavy traffic. Is that the case? Is, do they need more stone than they actually envisaged at first? Thanks, Councillor. I'll take that. Um, the the stone it's there's, there's not um, a significant additional stone um, from what we um, envisaged, but certainly one of the things that has been happening is we've been aware that there's um, been deposits of mud and thingy on the road. Um, this is actually a live issue for an enforcement officer, um, and this week he's actually been speaking to the developer um, and putting in place. Um, better uh, facilities to keep the roads clean, so there is a, a wheel wash um, at the site exit. Um, there's been some. Uh, 
lack of use of that from some drivers. Um, I'm not saying that that's a site-wide issue, but we have noticed that. So um, we've asked the developer to push down on that really hard. They've also hired um, and we're requiring them to continue to keep on hire um, a road sweeper um, just to, to continue to clean the uh, the main road and round about the site um, entrance as well. So uh, we are aware and we are dealing with it. Um, so hopefully over the next few weeks you'll see a difference in that and um, that the roads will be in better condition. But there shouldn't be any significant change in the volume of vehicles. Um, albeit when the concrete pours start, there will be small spikes in vehicles because once that starts, they have to keep that going. Um, so uh, they're, they're short operations, but occasionally there might be peaks of vehicles on the road beyond what we've had, um, but they will be short term and we're aware of it. But certainly the mud issue is, is getting looked at and hopefully that will improve just shortly. Hey, Councillor Lennox. Thanks, Provost. Um, I'd just like to say that the site visits that were arranged were very beneficial in terms of our understanding of the, the site and some of the terminology and everything else that's used here. I mean, the first time we saw uh, one of these reports, it was like going over the top of our heads, but now we've got a better appreciation and understanding. So thanks to the officers for arranging that and uh, hopefully we can maybe go and see some of the other sites at some point in time in the near future. Thank you. Thanks. I would always encourage uh, folk to go along and site visits. It gives you a much better understanding of the issues. Thanks for that. Uh, members, any other questions? Are we going with the recommendations? Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Final one today um, is the update report on progress of planning applications which have been recommended for approval, which are subject to the conclusion of an appropriate legal agreement and or are legacy planning applications in East Ayrshire. And that's David. Thanks, David. Thanks, Chair. Um, this report is the quarterly report on progress with applications subject to a legal agreement and legacy planning applications. Um, the report covers the period of October to December 2022. Um, in terms of this reporting quarter, paragraphs 10 and 11 and appendix table 1 show that there are five applications awaiting conclusion of legal agreement, which is one more than the last quarter. Uh, one further application has been concluded during that reporting period. Um, one application has stalled during this reporting quarter, and if no progress is made during the next reporting quarter, the intention would be that we would return that to committee. However, because we are now um, a month and a half down from this reporting quarter, I can actually confirm that there has been progress in this quarter, um, and that has moved on. So um, that's a slightly changed position. Um, in respect of legacy applications, uh, paragraphs 12 and 13 and appendix table 2, show that there are 17 legacy applications, which is one more than the last reporting quarter. Four legacy applications were cleared um, in this particular quarter. Um, many of these applications are under processing agreements, which project manages the application to revise timescales. Um, and a number of these applications will and indeed have been cleared in the next reporting quarter, which is essentially the January to March period. So because we're into that, I can I attest that there's, some of them have now dropped off. Um, Members are therefore asked to note the content of the report and the actions in each application set out in the tables, uh, which is essentially to allow continued progress on each legacy and legal agreement application. Thank you. Thanks, David. Members, uh, recommendations are there and it's got all the, the ones that are getting dealt with at the moment. Are we happy? Oh, Maureen? Uh, sorry, thanks ever so much. Uh, I really have difficulty with these hands, but um, so could I just ask for some clarification then? Uh, because I I actually find it quite confusing that we've got this report, but we already know some of the outcomes. Just for my own clarity, could I just ask table number two? Uh, are the Area are the application numbers that have already been determined but not reported uh, yet in this paper are 21 slash 0262 PP, 21 slash 035 slash PP, 21 slash 0721 PPP, 
and I think that's the only and I think that's the only three that I'm aware of. Hey, hi, Councillor Kai. Um, we're somewhat caught here. Just it's an unusual one um, in terms of the, the timings of when this report could be lodged because it's the period October to December um, to be able to lodge in time for the January committee, which we would normally do in the first committee after the, the quarter. It was too tight with the holiday period. We couldn't conclude the report. Um, in time to lodge, which is why we're now at this uh, planning committee. So we're halfway through the next reporting quarter, but telling you about the last one. Um, so in terms of some of those um, applications that you referred to, there's actually a good handful on here that, that have been determined. Um, you certainly picked up on some of them. So 210262 PP at Home Farm and Cross House was at, uh, in front of planning committee um, in January. Um, the 210352 PP, which is the um, Bank Street in Kilmarnock, has been determined um, and cleared. Um, we've also determined and cleared the 210596 PP at Kames Hill and Rickard and Roden Kilmarnock, that was under delegated powers. Um, 210721 Triple P um, at the Meadows um, has also been cleared under delegated powers um, uh, between the end of this reporting period and now. Um, and obviously today um, you heard that the final one, the 210778 triple P, which is, is Barony. Um, so that's also um, obviously as of today um, come through. Um, we continue to work on the others. So it's largely a result of the, the gap between when this report period or this quarter uh, finishes and when we were actually able to bring this to committee. So th some things have moved on, which we would report in the next reporting quarter anyway, but I'm as well giving you an update as we're sitting here. OK, Hopefully that's that good. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Yes. OK, folks, thank you. Any further questions? Accept the report. Thanks very much, everyone, uh, and thanks for your forbearance for today. It was quite a long meeting. And I uh, wish you all the best for the weekend. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair.